We're pleased to have with us today Dr. John Green, who comes to us with a very distinguished career in dentistry. Um, Dr. John Green has been um, the highest ranking dental officer in the public health service. He's been president of the American Association of Dental Research, of the International Association of, of Dental Research, dean at the University of California, San Francisco, and also chair of the Council of Deans for the American Association of Dental Schools. Welcome, Dr. John Green. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Um, let's, let's begin at the beginning. Um, and you grew up in Ashland, Kentucky. Where, where is that? Well, Ashland is in a, a small town in uh, northeastern Kentucky where Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky come together, right on the Ohio River. Uh -huh. and, and you grew up during the Depression years in, in Ashland. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that was like. Okay, I um, grew up, I, I was born in the city in uh, Ashland before the Depression, and then we moved to the country in 1932, right in the middle of the Depression. My dad uh, decided to buy a farm and did, and we moved there, and we were, there were uh, six of us children, had uh, four sisters and, and a brother. And by the way, all of them still live there in the area. Some had moved away, but have moved back to that same place. Um, when we lived on the farm, uh, he had my dad had some brothers, and um, my mother had a family too. And they, since my dad worked for the federal government and had a regular salary, they tended to come to my dad and to borrow money, and mm -hmm. and uh, we were relatively well off at the time, I guess. Uh, compared to others during the Depression, but it, it was a wonderful time for us on the farm. So, so your dad ran the farm as, as well as working for the government? Yes, he was a mail carrier, worked for oh. the city mail carrier in the city, and uh, so we lived on this small farm, 67 acres, uh, just six miles out of town. We did a little truck farming, uh, had uh, cows and horses mm -hmm. and pigs and chickens and uh, raise strawberries and raise corn and feed for the for the uh, farm animals that we had. So Dad worked in town, and my brother and I did uh, much of the work on the farm. Times that we had. Where, where were you in the birth order among these six kids? I was. Let's stop and think. I was uh, uh, fourth. Uh huh. And and so then you grew up in grew up in Ashland, and I guess. Let's see, that was 32, around 41 is when the, was, well, like almost an anniversary yesterday of Pearl Harbor. Yes, uh, I grew up there and I went to a, a small school, uh, a consolidated um, elementary school and then a farther away to a consolidated Boyd County High School. And just after I graduated from high school, uh, that's, uh, I had a, a scholarship to go to over to a junior college there local in, in Ashland. So I went there for one year and I graduated in 44 from, uh, uh, from high school and went over to uh, uh, the community college and for a six, I so we went to a summer school and then in the fall went to that term and then in, in January some of the guys said, you know, the draft's getting close and one of these days we're going to be going to the service and so they talked me into going over and signing up to go to the navy my dad was very unhappy with that and but i found out that my dad had gone had done the same thing with the first world war oh, is that right? and so he knew <clears throat> what it was like so he was worried about me going off to the, mm -hmm. to the navy my brother was already in the army at the time and we signed up to go in the Navy uh, to study electronics. It was uh, took the, what they call the Eddy test to take an exam to to um, if we could get into that part of the Navy, then we could go into school and and study uh, radar and sonar and Loran and all of that kind of thing. So you were in the Navy for how long? I was in the Navy for almost two years. Okay, and so so the the war ended while you were while you were in the navy then yes i was stationed in san francisco at the time ah. when the war ended in japan in fact i had shore patrol duty in downtown and uh, on market street <clears throat> the night that uh, vj day 
came along. Mm -hmm. And it was a wild time, as you might imagine, <laughs> down on Market Street. But I was stationed on Treasure Island and uh, was, was there, and uh, it was a wild time. You, then you got out of the Navy and... Well, I uh, got out of the Navy. I actually was, uh, it was a little bit, just a little bit of a story there before getting out of the Navy. I was uh, moved from Treasure Island down to um, Terminal Island to join a ship. When I got there and the ship wasn't there, they sent me back to Treasure Island. They said, the ship isn't here, it hasn't been finished yet. And so they finally sent, found out it was under construction up in Washington, state of Washington, and went up there and we found the ship uh, as it was being finished and put it under uh, had the, the original, the initial uh, uh, testing of the ship. And then from there, it took us down to San Diego and uh, left the Navy from there. It seems like every time I try to get away from <laughs> California, I end up going back. Uh, but I went to San Diego and then grad went from there and then went back to the junior college where I had been before in Ashland and thought at that time I might go into electrical, en electrical engineering since I had had uh, considerable training in the Navy. And, uh, the, and the career counselor, however, said there's so many people coming out of the service uh, that uh, have electrical background or going into engineering, it doesn't look like the field to go into. So as I graduated from the community college, the only th I had a smattering of courses. The only thing I could uh, qualify in, uh, for an associate in arts was in uh, pre-nursing. So I got a pre-nursing degree from there and then graduated. Then uh, while I was trying to decide where to go next, to go on to college uh, talking with my local uh, friendly dentist, family dentist, uh, he encouraged me to go to apply to dental school. So I went on to Louisville then, to University of Louisville for a, uh, out to the Belknap campus for, to finish to get my bachelor's degree. And while I was out there, I had finished one year and uh, I applied, did apply to dental school, but I didn't have all the credentials. So they didn't accept me. I didn't, hadn't taken organic chemistry at the time. So in the summer, I went back home and went to Marshall College in West Virginia and finished up, uh, got my mm -hmm. uh, organic chemistry out of the way. And then the dean from the dental school called me somewhere in September and said, uh, Green, uh, would you still like to go to dental school? I said, well, sure, but uh, hasn't that already started? He said, yes, so it's about two weeks underway, but uh, there's a place opened up. One fellow didn't show up, mm. and I wonder if you'd like to go. And I said, well, but I'll be so far behind, I'll never catch up. And he said, well, I don't think that'll be a problem. He said, I've looked at your record. You should do okay. So I went to dental school, but I was scared to death. <laughs> I thought I would never make it because I was two weeks behind already. I'd heard so many things about it tough it was, so I hit the deck running yeah. and worked harder probably than I would have otherwise. When you, th when you think back at, at all those years leading up to the, you know, the, um, to, to the Ashland Community College and the, the pre-nursing degree, um, did you have any inkling before then that you might end up in dentistry? No. Before that, before that I thought I would go into farming. Oh. When I was in high school, I was a very active member of the Future Farmers of America. I ended up being president of our local chapter and going to state competitions and that sort of thing, and I really loved it. And I uh, had some projects on our farm, different things that I did, and I uh, really enjoyed it. So I, my dream was <clears throat> to go to the University of Kentucky and go to Lexington to study agriculture and someday to live in Lexington, Kentucky. That was the ultimate dream for me, <laughs> to live there because that was the Mecca, that's where great basketball was and, and a beautiful part of the state. Did you play basketball? I played uh, basketball some, but not a whole lot. I mm -hmm. played more baseball than I did basketball. Uh, so, so tell me about the switch. I mean, what, well, why did you give up on the farming? The big, the big switch came later when I, after I'd been, to, uh, been away to the Navy and I also had, had that kind of a training and came back and, and um, my mother used to take me to the local to, to, to go with her to see the local dentist when she had some dental problems. Mm -hmm. 
used to take me and the dentist uh, who was a friend of the family uh, was also uh, very friendly towards the children that came in and it, it sort of took a liking to me and began to let me uh, run the chair up and down and handle <laughs> equipment and, and watch what he was doing. And uh, he uh, kept saying, now you should go into dentistry, you should go into dentistry, say you like this sort of thing. <laughs> And my mother encouraged me to go to mm -hmm. think about, about dentistry. And then um, after I had gone as far as I had, I began to realize that uh, working on a farm was, was uh, working all the time. You never, mm -hmm. never get the work done. And you weren't helping people as much as you were helping yourself on the farm. And I just saw this as a more desirable field to work with people more than working with animals and so mm -hmm. uh, But it was largely the biggest influence was the local dentist. He encouraged me to go and, and was always my counselor all the way through school mm -hmm. and also later on in my career. Interesting. The, the rest of the family, I mean, your siblings, um, mm -hmm. it sounds like they've sort of stayed in the, the Ashland area. Did yes, they have. We had a wonderful childhood. Uh, I had a dad that was uh, used to be a semi-pro baseball player, and he loved to play games and uh, with the six of us. And we had friends that had lar large families as well, and we had a large place to live and play. So we worked very hard. But whenever we'd work hard and be get tired after a while, dad would say, okay, that's enough. Let's go play. <laughs> we'd go fishing or go play baseball or play mm -hmm. steal the flag or go make mm -hmm. ice cream or do something. But we had a wonderful time on the farm and uh, a lot of friends in the area. Mm -hmm. So the others have stayed there. And uh, I get back as often as I can still. They're all still there. My mother and dad have passed away. Mm -hmm. My dad was uh, my, one of my major heroes in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he had a great influence on me. Of course, my mother did too. But uh, he kept counseling me. And I uh, followed his, I learned an awful lot from that area. Mm -hmm. Uh, morals and, and what's good in life and what's not good in life, how to live, and, and he taught me how to die. He was just a very brave soldier, mm. great guy. Um, tell me about teaching you how to die. Well, and my dad uh, developed uh, cancer of the colon. When he was told uh, that he was uh, uh, had cancer, he said, uh, well, I guess I need to go home and cut the grass. Hmm. And uh, I mean, that's a pretty shocking thing for people. It was for him too, obviously. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> he said, uh, I need to, I got some work to do. I know I need to go do that and took care of that. I came, I got to go home and talk with him a lot. And he went through, wanted to make sure of the diagnosis, make sure that was okay. And once they figured out what the diagnosis was and how far it had already spread, he said, uh, well, I said, I don't really want any to go through what my friends have gone through, and that's mm. the chemotherapy and radiation. <laughs> and I uh, said, don't, said, don't uh, try to get me to go through that. And I said, well, Dad, you know, I'm going to be selfish. You need to understand that. I, I want to um, listen to your wishes, but I, if, if you leave it to me, I will do everything I can to try to hold on to you as long as I can. And he said, well, said, let's not do anything heroic here. Hmm. He said, I've had a great life, and I want to enjoy the life as long as I can. If I go through that, I won't be able to. Hmm. And uh, so he, uh, he just said, uh, I'll do the things I, I need to, but I don't want to go through that. Hmm. <clears throat> so I don't think that would be wise. So he, so he went, he continued functioning right up till the end, doing everything that he could and trying to make everybody else comfortable with that and showed his love to everyone and, and uh, mm. appreciated the people gathering around him. Mm. But he said that uh, I've, I've enjoyed it and uh, he felt well prepared to die. He had been very active in the church. He was a deacon in the church. His brother was a minister of the church. And, and uh, we were all very mm. religious, uh, very uh, active in, in our church activities back there. And he was just, mm. remarkable just a, man. A, a remarkable man. That's yeah. a good way to put it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I'm also interested in, in the heroic qualities 
and he said he, he was one of your heroes. Right. And, uh, I'm kind of interested in, in what some of the other qualities were. Well, I, I think the, the, the fact that uh, he always felt that a person should work hard and do what they should do, but be fair in everything that you do and the highest mm -hmm. of honesty and integrity hmm. and uh, trying to help other people wherever he could, always uh, able to overcome uh, difficulties in life, living in the country, working on the farm, and he was working in town and uh, carrying mail. Uh, was a hard life for him, but he never complained about it. Hmm. But he always found a way to, to work through, and the storms came, the winter storms, he'd get out and push the cars and help people get their cars out of the way. And he was just, just always doing the right things, it seemed to me. Yeah. And had time to play. And always had time to play. He had a great sense of humor. I hmm. uh, loved to play tricks and to entertain kids and hmm. magic tricks and stuff. And it's just a, oh. had a great sense of humor. Oh, interesting. Um, Let's let's come back to let's come back to Louisville now and okay. and, and dental school. Um, what was dental school like for you? Well, dental school was was fascinating for me. Uh, a lot of hard work, but I, the um, one of the things that's different as I look back now from the way dental schools are now. Um, this was in it was a small school, uh, three story building and uh, focused primarily on the clinical. There were lectures, but mostly focused on clinical. And there were places that the faculty went where students couldn't go. And that was the thing was always, I always wondered what that was. And on the third floor, the faculty uh, did some research up there, but students could never go up there. They didn't know what went on up there on, the, <laughs> on that third floor. It was a, like a private place. Uh, we had a lab in the basement, and we were down there a lot, and the faculty were up on, the, up on this third floor. And at that time, there was still uh, uh, quite a bit of segregation within mm. in Louisville. And if you had uh, uh, black people come in, they were treated up on the third floor. And we never, never treated black people. They took them up there for care. And the faculty treated them? And the faculty took care of them up there. They didn't want to turn them away, <laughs> but we didn't treat them. <laughs> I thought it was it was interesting. <laughs> and, and looking back on it, <laughs> um, when I it, it, one of the interesting pieces that while I was in dental school, I worked at the hospital. In fact, uh, where I first started out, I I didn't have the money to to pay all of my my tuition and bills, so I had to work. First started out, I worked and lived in the medical fraternity house because I had a friend who had gone to community college in Ashland who was in medical school, and he, he was the manager of the house. So I lived at the uh, Phi Chi house and um, took care of the furnace, and that way I was able to pay for uh, to, uh, They took care of my cost of living there. Then in the second year, another friend who was uh, a senior uh, farther up in medical school got me a job over in the hospital working in the clinical lab. And I lived in mm -hmm. the intern's quarters. And the intern's quarters were right back of, at the um, Jefferson County Hospital, just across the street, or across a driveway from the emergency room. So my entertainment on Saturday nights and weekends was the emergency room. I could hear the ambulances mm -hmm. coming and I'd go over and help out in the emergency room, mm -hmm. cleaning up wounds and suturing and doing mm -hmm. this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Plus I worked in a clinical lab and uh, I worked 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lived an awful lot of time in the lab. I had a cot there and I'd go in and out of, out of there. So you were putting in 40 hours a week working plus dental school? Right. Um, but that was all at night, but a lot of times I was sleeping over there in the lab uh, mm. in, in the cot. The reason I mention all of that, there are two, two different aspects of that. One was when uh, we had uh, a course in public health dentistry on Monday mornings. And um, Monday mornings I was so tired, I'd sit in the back of the room and sleep in my public <laughs> health classes. <laughs> and uh, later on in life when someone asked me about, uh, asked the professor, Dr. Robinson, 
ask him about uh, this fellow Green, what, how would he do in public health? He said, well, I don't know. I said, he sits back there and sleeps all, <laughs> all the time, but I know he works a lot. And uh, I said, probably okay, but I, I really don't know a lot about him because he slept so much. So, so given that, why did you go into public health? <laughs> But I just want to, uh, the, other, the other piece of that uh, that I'd like to come back to, and that is the fact, the exposure that I had living in the medical fraternity house with mm -hmm. my friends there mm -hmm. and working and living in the hospital was a very valuable experience for me that has come to help me throughout life. Mm -hmm. And we may want to come back to that a little yeah. bit later. I just don't want to miss that, that okay. trend. Okay, okay. Well, why did I go into public health? Yeah, after having slipped through Robinson's lectures. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I didn't see public health. The, the opportunity that I had to go into public health was, was um, primarily around an internship and around clinical dentistry. It wasn't around what he was teaching. He was teaching oh. about fluoride and prevention and, and community activities, which didn't really excite me at the time. I see. So you were actually going into a, a kind of a clinical internship. Right, right. Okay, and it happened to be in the public health service. <clears throat> That's right. Okay. That was more, more of an extension of what I was preparing myself for was clinical dentistry. So, so when you were in dental school and you would kind of imagine where you were going to be three or four years or five years out of dental school, what was, what was in your mind? Well, my mind uh, was what I had prepared myself for was to go back to Iceland, go into practice with mm. this doctor. Hall. To, oh, to actually practice with, with your family dentist. That's right. Oh. And he, he had always encouraged me to do that. said, oh. someday, said, uh, you'll want to come back here and uh, you just come and work with me and oh. it gradually take over my office. And, mm. um, uh, and I might just loop back to Dr. Hall just a second, uh, something sure. I didn't cover before about his influence on why dentistry and, and also why not medicine because mm -hmm. he had a brother also who was uh, in medicine. Um, at the time when I uh, was trying to decide which, which uh, career path to take, I began to think back about these two brothers, the two doctors Hall. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, uh, whenever we would, families would get together to uh, the kids to play and do things, go to picnics and parties and mm -hmm. stuff that we had. The dentist most always was there, but the, his brother, the physician, often had to go to the hospital, had to go see a patient, mm -hmm. wasn't available to be with the family. And I had enjoyed um, my family life, uh, childhood life so much, and having family and all around. I thought, well, later on in life, I would like to be able to be with my family. Mm -hmm. And the, the ability to channel time and to control yourself and, and to be with, with family was a very important part for me. And so that made, it made a difference back at that time. But when I graduated from dental school and had a, an opportunity to go into an internship with the Public Health Service, which I had, had applied for, it seemed very attractive. I went to see Dr. Hall and I said, what do you think? Should I do it? And he was not very happy about that. He said, uh, well, I really wanted you to come here, back to Iceland. We need you. We don't have enough dentists here and, and we need you back here. But he said, if you want to, uh, go ahead, but don't get used to taking a regular salary. Mm. He said, if you get on a salaried position, I'm afraid you, you won't come back. And so that was the, that mm. was the admonition that he gave me. Then I went to see my dean, and I said, uh, <clears throat> Dean, what do you think? What was, what was the dean's R name? Raymond Myers. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you think? Should I, should I go? And he said, well, he said, well, Green, we've had you here for four years, the best school in the country, and you're graduating at the top of your class. You don't have any more to learn. He said, you've learned it all. Why do you need to go take an internship? And then I, when he told me that, that I had learned it all, I knew that I needed to go on and I shouldn't put too much weight on his, what he mm -hmm. had to say, because I knew I yeah. didn't know it all. I knew, I thought I knew a lot, but when I got to my internship in Chicago, there were interns from two other schools. They each thought they had graduated from the best school in the country. <laughs> the dean told and them the same. And they knew it all. <laughs> <laughs> the dean had told them the same thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we each had learned some different techniques and learned, yeah. and yeah. we learned a lot from each other. So, yeah. So the when, when you went into that internship, did you think that at the end of it you were going to return to Ashland and and go to work with Hall? Was that yes? That was the plan. Yeah, that was the plan. I made very sure that when I joined the public health service, that I could. Um, uh, leave when I wanted to. Mm -hmm. It was not like joining the other parts of the, of the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could leave at the end of one year if you wanted to. They preferred you stay on at least two years beyond that. But if you decided to leave, you could. Mm. And uh, I made very sure of that. So what was what happened at the end of the internship? And, and you, you didn't well, return to Ashland. <clears throat> um, I, uh, you know, I had never lived very far away from Ashland before. <clears throat> Except I'd been in the Navy, but I'd never mm -hmm. really actually moved around very much. And I liked working in the hospital, and I thought well, it would be nice to be able to be in, a, in another hospital and get uh, a greater variety of, of patients, learn more. Uh, I, I learned a tremendous amount there. And so I applied to stay on for one more assignment, just one more. One more. <laughs> So I applied to a large hospital, to go to a large hospital, Staten Island. Second uh, choice was to go to uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. And third choice was, uh, was New Orleans, they had mm -hmm. those three hospitals. Well, I received uh, my orders, it was to go to San Francisco. No, neither of the three. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I ended up in San Francisco, the hospital back in California again. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, uh, uh, I'll never forget when I first arrived, I had driven from Chicago. There were companies that advertised driving, moving cars cross country. You could mm -hmm. drive their car and they would pay your way and this sort of thing. So I shipped all, this was in July. And I shipped all of my summer or my winter clothes and everything and went out and I was in the shorts and nylon mesh shoes and this sort of thing and drove into San Francisco, went out by the hospital about 4.30 in the afternoon and the fog was rolling in and it was cold and it was in July. And it was so cold I went uh, downtown to where I was going to stay that night after fixing a flat tire, mm -hmm. by the way, and uh, called home to Ashland to my mother and I said, uh, I'm in San Francisco, I'm fine but I'm freezing to death. I hate this place. <laughs> and I'll be home as soon as I can get out of here. <laughs> but it didn't turn out that way. No, yeah. yeah. So, so at what point um, did you decide to make the public health service a career? Okay. Um, I, I went at the hospital in San Francisco. I was a part of the senior staff there to train other interns and other mm -hmm. residents. So I stayed there, and um, after um, on the second year, I was preparing to apply to go to uh, to school to be an oral surgeon. Mm. And the public health service, is, you know, is a quasi-military service, so you're moved around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. The regional um, dental officer in San Francisco was from Kentucky, and George Nevitt, and he had been out to the campus and met me and knew something about my background and knew I was a Kentuckian. And it turned out what he had done while I was trying to figure out how to get to oral surgery, go to oral surgery, because I, I loved clinical dentistry and I, I, I loved every part of it. I just wanted to keep learning more, more things. Uh, he had contacted uh, Chief Dental Officer in Washington and said uh, he would like to have me become a trainee in the regional office. And they sent orders for me, transferring me to the regional office. And I hadn't. That was, came as a, a complete surprise. And the regional office was where? In San, in San, oh, San Francisco. OK. Right downtown. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was moved down there to that office. And um, for six months, uh, he said, uh, I want you to go in there, and I want you to learn, read everything you can about uh, public health dentistry and about the, what happens in the states. We were responsible for western states and everything that mm -hmm. went on there. And I worked with a Jack Vermillion, uh, mm -hmm. whom I later, with whom I later did some publications. 
and Jack kept giving me papers and things to write, uh, write uh, to read. And then I went in to see Dr. Nevitt for my performance evaluation after about six mm -hmm. months. And Dr. Nevitt uh, gave me a, a very, rather mediocre performance rating, which I wasn't used to having. <laughs> and so I said, what's this all about? He said, well, so all you've been doing is sitting in there reading. And I said, well, that's what you told me to do. <laughs> he said, well, I expect you to be out in the States finding out what, uh, what's going on out there and helping the States. Uh, and um, so he didn't see me for the next six months. After that, I just kept, went out to the States. But during that time, I became unhappy with what was, what was there. And went back to Kentucky I, I, on leave, on vacation, talked with Dr. Hall and talked with others. And I uh, came back and I filled out my form to resign from the public health service. I was going. going when, when, when you said you were un unhappy with what was going on out there, that was? Well, I did uh, with, with my role. Oh, I not see. Not with what they were doing, but okay. it just didn't seem like what I wanted to do to be an itinerant dentist going from one state to another and checking on and trying to help them. It just mm -hmm. it mm. didn't excite me. Mm -hmm. um, but they got me, when I came back, I didn't tell anyone that I had this, my papers all filled out. I carried in my briefcase and, and I expressed some dissatisfaction or restlessness in what was happening. And they got me involved in a couple of studies which uh, kind of interested me. And one was studying the effects of fluoride uh, in the state of Washington. We went around studied mm -hmm. uh, uh, school children in mm. 19 uh, locations and I saw what this Dr. Robinson had been talking about back in, in mm -hmm. the dental school. There really is a difference in, in uh, the kids that grew up where there was fluoride and where there wasn't. It was a dramatic difference and that really, really was impressed me. Then I did a study on the use of uh, uh, this really came out, I read something in, in a journal someplace, somebody in England had done something looking at mm -hmm. uh, color indicators of where cavities might form mm -hmm. uh, using methyl red as an indicator and when there's acid formation it would change color. So Jack Vermillion and I designed a study to be done in Las Vegas to study, uh, see if we could predict where cavities would form. Uh, and we uh, had fun putting that together, and that, that kind of got me interested and said, well, maybe there's some other things other than just going around talking with people, but actually right. doing some things out there. But I still was out, still on the cusp of trying to decide, do I stay with this thing or not? If time was running by and Dr. Hall was getting anxious. And, <laughs> and your resignation papers were in the briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> they were getting pretty old by that time. In fact, I had even gone back and I decided that his office was too small and I'd picked out another office and, and, oh. and had uh, design and had the forms filled out to order equipment and I had all that in my briefcase. And they found out about that. The next thing I knew, I received a call from a chief dental officer and asked if I would be interested in going to be a member of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And I said, well, I don't know what that is, it sounds interesting. But that's what I ended up doing, is deciding to go to CDC, Centers for Disease Control, be the first dentist to ever participate in that epidemic intelligence service. No, no what? What and, kind of outfit is that? And, and, and th that was the point at which I just had to decide. I said, you know, I talked to myself about it. I said, no, you've either got to, if you go to that, you're really going to stay on. Mm -hmm. If you don't, uh, then this is the time to get out. And that was when I made the decision, because that was so attractive to me. Well, the Epidemic Intelligence Service is, um, it, it, it was put together by a Dr. Alex Langmuir, one of the well-known people in, in really what's called shoe leather epidemiology, put together a training program for young people, primarily physicians, to train to uh, be able to chase down epidemics and try to find out the cause of the epidemics and, and uh, hmm. bring some, uh, try to end, end epidemics around the country, whatever they were. And since I was beginning to get involved a bit in epidemiology and, and dentistry and the regional office, the, thing, the things we were doing there, 
they uh, said, well, maybe it would be good to have a dentist go through that. Don Galligan was the uh, one that had a lot to do with that at the time. And so I decided to go. Transferred me. I thought it was a permanent transfer as a normal transfer station, mm -hmm. duty station. Moved to Atlanta. Very intensive uh, course uh, with all the others, with the physicians. Uh, there might have been a nurse or two in it, about 30 people. Hmm. Very intense course for about six weeks. At the end of that time, what they do is send people out then to work in laboratories or different places in other parts of the country. They don't, most of them don't stay mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, the program, total program, is a two-year program, a training program. So I was transferred after six weeks, after I'd moved everything mm -hmm. to Atlanta, moved me to Kansas City, to the field station at uh, uh, Kansas City Medical Center, uh, University of Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, was a part of field station where we studied uh, epidemics from there, and I went out and so you were looking at epidemics then generally, it wasn't just in dentistry? Nothing related to dentistry. Oh, and I that see. was the idea, to expose me then to the methods okay. that were used okay. in uh, acute disease epidemiology, mm. then to bring those methods back to apply them to dentistry. That Got was it. the idea. They're trying to be, uh, they were thinking long range and mm -hmm. trying to help out. So I started chasing down epidemics. Um, Polio-like diseases, this was right in the height of the polio. Mm -hmm. uh, out, uh, outbreaks and uh, major concern in the country. And it was exciting to be mm -hmm. out there chasing things down. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, Mason City, Iowa, I remember an outbreak of polio-like disease. And mm -hmm. Turned out to be a Coxsackie B5 uh, epidemic. Uh, people were, were frightened and mm -hmm. we were out there gathering information, gathering bloods and and uh, various specimens and brought him back to the laboratory mm. and working him up and then went out to a number of places. We, uh, the, the director of the field station was a Dr. Leo Furcolo and uh, his specialty was histoplasmosis. So we started then, uh, I got involved in a lot of his work in histoplasmosis mm. and it, it, it mimics uh, tuberculosis a lot. Mm. some of the uh, pulmonary lesions. So we were going around to, to a sanitaria where people had uh, tuberculosis and screened them to see if any of them really were there with histoplasmosis Osmosis rather than tuberculosis and found yeah. a lot of people that were, were misdiagnosed. Misdiagnosed, but in there exposed to tuberculosis. Mm. Uh, so mm. that was another part of that. And then I got involved in the studying uh, equine encephalitis and I became the um, equine encephalitis surveillance officer for six Midwestern states for a while while I was there. Was, it, was anybody surprised that, that someone with a DDS degree was doing that? Well, uh, yeah, some, some were, but after a while they got to know me <laughs> and, and knew where I was from and it was, yeah. it was okay. And transferred me back then later to, after a year, back to, to Atlanta and uh, while I was there, I continued with my surveillance of equine encephalitis. And that's where I met uh, Gwen Rustin, who, uh, whom I, we married uh, some couple mm. years later. Mm. And so that was a very fortuitous assignment for me. Mm -hmm. That became, uh, my, started my family from there. When, when did you move back into dentistry again? Um, well, after I got back to, to CDC, uh, <coughs> um, we finished, finished the assignment uh, after finished two years with the program. Then while I was there, Al Russell, you know that you remember Al Russell, who was uh, at that time, he was the epidemiologist in dentistry in the United States. He had been, uh, uh, had decided, had, had developed the periodontal index, the Russell PI. Now, at, at that point, had you already developed what's now called the Green and Vermilion Oral Hygiene Index? Yes, I, uh, the original version of that. Mm -hmm. That I really started that while I was in uh, 
at the uh, the uh, regional office in San Francisco. When you were working with that methyl red? No, this no. was uh, not related to that okay. one. That was another little project. Uh -huh. and, and that was a kind of an interesting start, uh, if I might just uh, talk about that a little bit. There was a, a psychiatrist on the staff in the regional office, and uh, we used to have lunch with him. He was a very interesting fellow and uh, very um, curious and, and uh, uh, we just enjoyed, Jack Vermillion and I enjoyed talking with him a lot, and talked about the problems of um, periodontal disease and um, about the problems of associated, uh, the, he was talking about dental problems associated with a lot of the, the kids that he saw that were uh, in the hospital up in Sonoma for retarded children, uh, mm -hmm. home for retarded children up there. And we sort of came up with the uh, question is, are the kids that have, who are mentally retarded, do they have some systemic uh, uh, weakness that might cause them to be more vulnerable to periodontal disease? <laughs> so we thought, well, maybe we should try to find that, get an answer to that question. So we decided we needed to compare, to compare kids on the level, uh, looking at their IQ, uh, and if they were otherwise, try to make them equal other than that, uh, see if we could find out whether there was anything, any, any relationship to mm -hmm. them. But in order to do it, we also had to look at their oral hygiene level because there was such a great difference. In order to be able to standardize across the two. And standardize yeah, across, yeah. right, to yeah. equalize that. All right. I started looking at the literature, there was nothing there but good, fair, and poor. People would say good, fair, and poor oral hygiene. There was no mm -hmm. plaque index or nothing of that type. So we said, well, we have to have something, and, I, and Jack Vermillion kept insisting. I said, there's no way, and Jack said, well, if you can, if you can say good, fair, and poor, you should, you, you should be able to describe that in some quantitative way. And I said, there's just no way to do that. After some prodding, and him sort of kept pushing me, we came up with a, an approach, and that was the original oral hygiene index came out of that, but it was so detailed that it really wasn't useful beyond that particular study, and later on we developed a simplified version of it. Oh, interesting. So, so with, with that in the past background, now you're talking to Al Russell about a, a, a periodontal index. Yeah, you know, Al <coughs> wanted then to tap my background that I had developed by that time and wanted me to join him. So I was um, then asked, uh, he got me involved some in some of his work, um, and he was doing some in the southeast and wanted me to come and help him. So I went out with, and learned the, the PI, the Periodontal mm -hmm. Index, how to use that. And while I was doing that, um, John Knutson, who was chief dental officer, uh, contacted me and said uh, he had had a contact from the World Health Organization who had had a contact from India. Mm. They were looking for someone to come and help them study their periodontal problems in India. Mm. He wanted to know if I would be willing to go. And I said, well, that sounds interesting. You know, I was still single. and. Uh, okay opportunity to travel in another part of the world. And they wanted me to go, and I said, but I don't know that much about, I haven't had that much experience in periodontal disease. So, well, you know the PI, periodontal index. Well, they, they'd, they'd asked for Al Russell, but he uh, wasn't well enough to go. And I said, you're the next in line. So you need, if you'll go, we're not free to go. So I said I would. Then, before I went, they decided they wanted to send somebody with me who was more experienced in periodontal disease, so they got Sig Ramfjord to go. Oh, I see. So the two of us went to, but Sig had been working on a, an index of his own. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we were supposed to go and, and teach people over there how to, what to do and leave some people well trained to go ahead and study their own, study their own problems. We got to Bombay. And when we got there, there was, um, they brought in uh, people from 13, each of their 13 schools, dental schools, to Bombay, and for two weeks we had training session. 
as it turned out, not only did we have the PI that I, Al Russell says, that's the flag that you've got to bear. You've got to carry that flag, the PI flag. That's the official index for the Public Health Service. And there was SIG came with his you know, flag. Sig he had his <laughs> flag. And then the dean of the school in Bombay, Dr. K.L. Shuri, had also developed an index. Oh, my. So there were three of us, each with a flag to carry, to wave, to teach the others how, what to do, how to study periodontal <laughs> disease. Well, <clears throat> we finally convinced Dr. Shuri not to push his there, although that was a bit of a struggle. But both Dr. Ramford and I um, were, we felt that we had the answer. So we taught him how to do both. And then we did a study in a, uh, some communities, uh, villages out away from Bombay, where we went out and examined kids. And as it, what we did is he did his index and I did the Russell index. And we came up with the same conclusions using either, either index mm -hmm. after, after all. Uh, but there I used the oral hygiene index to go with that. And by that time I had, had a, developed a simplified version to make it much easier to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stayed, we worked, we were in India for two months. Uh, gathering data and training people and it's a fascinating experience getting to work with Al Russell and with the people in India yeah. and tremendous periodontal problems. Mm. Uh, here you had people who had never been to a dentist, people who uh, had never had a toothbrush and uh, as you can imagine the amounts of uh, uh, debris and, yeah. and calculus that build up on people and you needed a gross index like the kind we had worked with over in the Sonoma Boys uh, School or, and uh, it, it was just a very valuable experience for me and you was able to use that information then later when I came back. We're going to take a little break now. Okay. Let's let's talk a little bit more about the about the India experience and um, and what went on for those two months. Okay, as I mentioned, it was a fascinating opportunity to go out and learn about India, but also and learn about uh, their periodontal problems and uh, about Sig uh, Ramford and the indexes mm -hmm. and how all of that worked. Um, certainly, we learned that. Periodontal disease is rampant in, in uh, India. Low tooth decay rates, but uh, tremendous amount of periodontal problems. And also, uh, we learned uh, using either of the two indexes that we were using sort of tended to give us what we wanted to know, and that was that, that uh, periodontal disease and uh, the uh, material, the plaque that was in the mouth was very important to that, that process. Um, after working with that for a couple of months, it was time, our assignment was just about ended. There was a chief dental officer by the name of Colonel Barry, who had been the uh, chief dental officer of Pandit Nehru uh, before and worked with him. Actually, he was Pandit Nehru's dentist. He was a very powerful person in the government. And um, he, he was the one who had asked us to come over and we had been assigned there because of him. Sig Ramford one day came home and back to the hotel and said, uh, John, there's something I need to tell you. He said, uh, Colonel Barry asked about, uh, said he'd like to have somebody stay over here and help with our problem. He said, it's a serious problem and we need to do something about it. He said, you all have pointed that out. And he said, do you think Green would be the one we ought to have stay? And Sig said, well, sure, he'd be good, but uh, said, I think he has a girlfriend back home. That he'd been getting letters from Atlanta ever, ever since he's been here. Well, the Colonel Barry said, "Well, if it's girls he wants, I'll take care of that." But uh, said, "If you think he ought to be here, then I'll call John Knutson and we'll have him put orders on him. He'll have to stay." <laughs> so Sig said, "John, my advice to you: if you want to go home, you probably ought to go." 
So I called up and caught the plane out the next day without contacting <laughs> Colonel Berry and went home because I, I didn't want to be tied to India. I, I did want to get home and we, um, Gwen and I were making uh, wedding plans by letter while I was in India. So I uh, got back to Atlanta as soon as I could. So that was the end of my, uh, that trip to, <laughs> to India anyway. <laughs> So, um, so were you married then in in, um, in, in Atlanta? Uh, then after I got back, let no. me just back up just a bit about my uh, uh, chance meeting uh, of Gwen, the one that I married. At the Epidemic Intelligence Service has a spring conference every year. And at that, uh, the people who have been working in the EIS come and give lecture, give a talk, a report on, on uh, some part of what they've done. And we were meeting in the Fulton County Medical Academy building. And um, the, the, the approach was if somebody gave a lecture and then somebody stood up to ask a question, somebody would bring a microphone. Somebody presented something and I uh, asked for a microphone and this beautiful young lady brought me a microphone. <laughs> uh, and that was turned out to be Gwen. And later I said, well, who was that? I traced her back, and she was working at CDC, and uh, they, they brought people, local people, oh, and right. they helped out. And uh, that was the young lady that I married then shortly after that. That was uh, not uh, just a few months before I went off to India. Mm. So we uh, kept that going while I was away, but I was anxious to get back yeah. and oh, came back and we got <laughs> married right. a few months after that. Oh. And then. We're there in Atlanta, and then we got moved then to uh, NIDR. By January, we got married in November, and in January, in the midst of a snowstorm, we moved into work with Al Russell. I had carried the flag successfully right. for him, I guess. Right. <laughs> so I went to work with him. Well, yeah, you got you got it down to one out of two as opposed to one out of three. <laughs> right. Um, track for me now the. Um, what went on that, that brought you to the point where you were appointed chief dental officer? Okay, I, I need to I move through a few steps now. Okay. At NIDR, work with Al Russell, learn more about uh, how he worked uh, with his index and how he managed things. Let me, let me just, if I can, just uh, an mm -hmm. interesting piece about Al Russell and the timing, how mm -hmm. things were. He used to use the uh, little uh, pins sort cards where you punch holes and, and, oh, you, and you put a put pen the through. Put knitting needle through. Yeah, knitting <laughs> needle and shake it like that. You go in the field and did that. We did a lot of field studies and at night he would go and punch, we'd punch cards and he'd put the needles through and shake them. I said, boy, there's an interesting relationship in this and that. We ought to be looking at that. And uh, so, uh, so I learned uh, that kind of sorting method. And so McBee sort of cards. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. McBee. Right, McBee sort card. And later on, when I was doing another study in, in India, later on in life, I, I was arranging to go over and, and um, do that. Went out to NIDR, and they were making the cards for me, and I got all ready to go. And just before I went, they were, uh, the, um, the executive officer, Mr. Fitzgerald, said, I asked him, have you got the, is the cards all ready? I said, yes, we've already shipped them. He said, oh, there's just one little thing. He said, you know all those holes around the outside of the car? He said, we didn't think you needed those, so we ordered them without the, the holes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that cost a lot more money, and we, <laughs> so we left those off. So I thought that was just fascinating that uh, that would happen. I ended up then having to ship uh, some over there with holes in it, and they transfer the information and so on. But from there to the chief dental officer, um, while I was working with Al Russell, John Knudsen, who was chief dental officer at the time, called me and said, uh, uh, John, I'd like for you to come and work for me. And I said, well, I've, I've got this thing I'm doing out here. And he said, well, that's all right. I've already cleared that. I want you to come and spend some time with me. Not as uh, assistant chief dental officer, but assistant to the chief dental officer. He made that very clear that I was only there to be an assistant to him as a training slot, as a management mm -hmm. training kind of thing. So I, I did move then to downtown and 
worked with the, the infamous John Knudsen. He had a, quite a reputation of being diff very difficult to work for. Was he? Uh, in some ways, but if you did your job, uh, he, uh, he was very good. He was a great teacher, taught me a lot of things, a lot of, had great wisdom, knew a lot of people, networking was great. I mean, he knew a lot of people, always taking me in places and having me sit in sit in some meetings where it was very uncomfortable with his own staff, uh, where they get into arguments and some of the uh, chiefs of some of the programs would uh, take him on and the uh, language got pretty foul and he'd foul right <laughs> back and I'd sort of trying to get out either under the table or get out. He'd say, no, stay, stay here. <laughs> so I got to watch and listen to all that. But he made, he made, uh, made, it, made it certain that while I was there, I was there as a trainee, and he said, I want you to, to promise me two things. One, that you continue at least a third of your time doing epidemiology, even though that's not a part of this job. I want you to continue your career development. And secondly, I, I want you to promise that you won't stay here longer than two years, that I don't want, I'll take advantage of you if you're not careful. I said, I mm -hmm. want you to promise that you'll move on to do something else in two years. And uh, we arranged for both of those. So it's a wonderful experience for me at that level. When, when you think back about what you learned from Knutson, what stands out in your mind? Uh, one was the hard work, obviously. I mean, he, he worked very hard. He was very clear in his communication with people. They brought in his chiefs, and he laid out, this is what I want to be done and his expectations, and they had frequent meetings with him and checking back and forth. One of the things is sort of a simple little thing was uh, I was always, when a piece of paper came in, a tough issue, I wanted to go ahead and solve it and get it out of there. And there were times when he would say, John, don't be in too big a hurry with that kind of thing. He said, there are some issues that if you'll take that piece of paper, put it over here on the side of your desk, hmm. wait a day or two, Sometimes those things just disappear. If you try to solve it too quickly, it's going to make it worse. Sometimes they just take care of themselves. You have to mm -hmm. age them carefully. Don't mm -hmm. let them stay too long, but watch them. Do it at the right time, but not mm -hmm. before it's time. And that was a, something that was hard for me to judge, but it... it, it uh, it's a real art. It real art, and, mm -hmm. and, and when to move and when not to move. That was one of the most important things I learned from John. So he gave you two years to learn what you could and then get out. Right, and at the end of the two years, well, while I was there, I went off to Ecuador, sent me off to the member of the National Intelligence, uh, the National um, I, Inter Interdepartmental Committee on Nutrition for National Defense. It's a long title, which was a part of um, a program to help developing countries. Uh, and I went as the dentist on the team, there were actually two of us, on the team to go and study nutrition throughout Ecuador. And I took my oral hygiene index, by the way, which Al Russell said is not that simple, John. Periodontal disease is tied into something that's uh, some X factor. We don't know what that mysterious thing is we've got to keep hunting. And I said, well, the oral hygiene plays an important role. He said, well, it's not that simple. So he never encouraged that piece of it so much, but I kept pushing. Took that with me and, and we studied throughout Ecuador. And while I was there, this, I know this is a diversion mm -hmm. from where you were headed before. The little story I'd like to tell you, however, in Ecuador, uh, Dr. Ernest Leatherwood and I traveled mm -hmm. down there and uh, we had read somewhere in a journal that some missionaries had found a tribe of Indians uh, over in the headwaters of the Amazon that had no tooth decay. And we were determined to try to find out what, what was going on. So we left the team and went on a missionary plane uh, two hours from the nearest uh, airport or highway back into the jungle to meet with the missionaries and to go and visit some the Hebrew Indians who were a neighboring tribe to some of the headhunters in the area. So we uh, did find uh, some of the Indians and went back and, and uh, examined them very carefully at a distance since <laughs> so we didn't want to lose our heads while we were there and found virtually no tooth decay in the population even though people, so people in middle age 
uh, some uh, mild marginal gingivitis, but not anything mm -hmm. to speak of, even though they'd never heard of a dentist and most, most of them had never seen a white man in this neighborhood before. And, uh, but they had a lot of black stain on their teeth. And we asked them through the missionary what that stain was all about. And they said, well, they believed that uh, if they went up on the mountain and gathered some berries every six months and ate those berries, chewed the berries, that that would uh, uh, keep the bugs out of their teeth. And so I said, well, can you get me some berries? So they went up and they got some, and I wanted to chew some, and the, the um, local people said, no, 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 didn't want me to do that because it turned my teeth black, and I wouldn't want them to be black. Ended up bringing some of the berries back to NIDR. Also, we gathered uh, some of the water and gathered some of the bits of food and stuff to bring back to see if there might be fluoride and could find no traces of fluoride in anything that we could bring back. Uh, never could find out anything in the berries that would do anything other than they were very acid. Hmm. And uh, with it, what they did, we don't know. I'd sure like to go back now with the latest later technology because that was back in 59 hmm. when we did that. And we learned how to make chicha and stuff, which we probably don't have time to cover. But, uh, it's a fascinating experience. So that was another two months assignment uh, mm -hmm. in Ecuador. Then back to, uh, came back to the chief dental officer's office. Then he arranged for me to go to school to get an MPH degree at uh, Berkeley. He took a personal hand in that, contacting deans, and now where we got this guy and who tried to describe me and where would be the best place to go. And went there and studied epidemiology there. From that, then we started a dental health center in San Francisco, uh, which had in it a, a branch of epidemiology. And uh, they asked me to head that up as soon as I finished the, the, the course. The dental health center? At the dental health center. Mm -hmm. uh, head up the, the, the uh, branch, the epidemiology branch right. in the center. And in that, I uh, took from uh, a paper that I had prepared as a as a student, uh, where I had done a literature review on the epidemiology of cleft lip and palate. Jack Vermillion and I decided to put together a, uh, an intelligence service gathering information on cleft lip and palate. We get put together a system of um, reviewing birth certificates from 29 states and two cities and uh, reviewed, uh, we had a con continuous review of, of those and tried to pull out of that reports of any, any birth defects. And we were particularly interested, of course, in cleft lip and palate. And the reason we started it, the idea was this was not long after the thalidomide scare, if you remember, right. um, the major birth defects that were occurring from that. And there was an epidemic going on, and people hadn't spotted it until it was gone quite long. And we thought by this kind of a screening monitoring method, we might be able to pick out the peaks of some micro epidemics or beginning epidemics or birth defects of any kind around the country. And if you could get some indication of some clustering, then we could then send somebody out, like an epidemic intelligence service, to follow up on it. It was a, a fascinating experience, and we gathered a lot of data about cleft lip and palate, but also on other birth defects that are, mm. uh, that are mentioned at birth, that are on the birth certificate. Then we did some studies in Iowa, following up to see how, va how valid the information was, how much under-reporting, over-reporting, that kind of thing. This, the system was very successful. Uh, sadly, we didn't have enough money to continue it on the scale that we felt was needed. We tried to, to convince Center for Disease Control to pick it up and run it themselves. At the time, they didn't either. Now they have a system somewhat like the one we started back at that time. Uh, then we also continued our work on periodontal disease uh, epidemiology as well. Okay, now take me up to the to the appointment as okay. as chief dental officer. I'm working, I'm working yeah. my way. To, I want to pass that interesting piece of yeah. the chief dental officer. After that, after being at, at the, the epidemiology branch there for about five years, 
uh, Viren Diefenbach, who was the director of the uh, uh, Division of Dental Health, called me and asked me to come to Washington to, to be his deputy director. After Don Galligan retired, mm -hmm. Dief moved up to be uh, director of the division. I became deputy director. Then Dief retired, and then I became director of the division. And while I was director of the division, then I was appointed chief dental officer in addition to... So you, had, you held both jobs? Held both jobs. Then after I was there for a while, I um, was running about a $14 million budget at that time. The director of the Bureau of Health Resources Development moved up to be to the next level above, which is the agency head, and they asked me to come and be director of that bureau. And that bureau had responsibility for not only for the dental division, but nursing and Allied Health and had hospital construction, regional medical program, so comprehensive were, uh, health planning and so all that. So you were responsible for all of those? All of those. Uh, oh. So I carried the chief dental officer position in with that. I see. Uh, one piece I just wanted to mention, since I had a $14 million budget in a division of uh, dental health, then I moved over to the Bureau and had a, a large budget, but it was the year of the impounded budgets that, uh, if you remember, Nixon, President Nixon, impounded the budget that Congress had appropriated because he didn't want to spend all that money. And then the Congress took him to court in about January of that year. The, the judge uh, ruled that uh, the president had to let the money loose and it had to be spent. So suddenly I had $1.4 billion to spend in six months. Oh my. So the, so the dam let loose and suddenly we uh, had a lot of friends. I'll bet. And I'm trying to track now that. What, give me the year now. That was in, um, in the 70s. I don't know the exact year. So that was, was that the time when there was that big push to expand the number of dental schools? That was still going on yep. at that time, and yep. medical schools, all the health professions. Right, right, right. So we were helping to build schools, build hospitals, and do regional medical planning, comprehensive health planning, and all of that. So we had uh, a lot of places to, to spend the money. That we had. When, you, when you look back at that, at that period of time when you were chief dental officer and, and assistant sur surgeon general and your responsibility with the Bureau of Health Manpower, I wonder if you could reflect on what you saw as the, the major challenge for you there or the, what saw with the major challenge? Well, the, the, the big challenge for me, it was a big jump from, mm -hmm. from a uh, dental health center to the, the uh, director of the division and, and getting, um, or getting involved in the Washington scene. See, there I was doing research and I was very comfortable and I didn't want to move. I, stayed, I was doing great, I thought I did a great job and I was having a lot of fun. Suddenly, I was put in this more of an administrative political arena. I'll give you an example of the sort of the shock therapy that I had. It was in there about the second week in Washington. Dr. Diefenbach was out of town. I had a call from the Surgeon General who was in his car on the way to the airport. And he said, a congressman from New York was supposed to go up and give a talk to the Manhattan Dental Society tonight but he's decided he can't make it. I've called Dr. Diefenbach and he's out of town. I want you to go up there and give a talk. And so I said, sir, <laughs> uh, I'll be glad to do what I can. What's it all about? And he said, I don't know. Call the congressman, he'll tell you. He said, I want you to go up and do it. I called up the congressman and said, uh, I understand you were supposed to give a talk up in Manhattan tonight. Is that right? And he said, yes. I said, well, what was it about? And he said, well, it's supposed to be about the federal government and private practice and dentistry. And I said, well, could I borrow your speech, your copy of your remarks or outline or something? He said, oh, no, I want to use that sometime. So uh, I, I can't let you have that. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll figure out a way to, to handle it. So I called then, called the uh, fellow who's in charge of the program in Manhattan and said, uh, I'm your man, I'm, I'll be up there tonight. He said, well, thank God, that somebody's coming. And, uh, but I said, I'm new, and I don't, uh, I don't know your situation, but I'll come, I'll 
come providing one thing. You promised me one thing, and that is that when I finish, that you'll tell them that I have to catch the next plane, don't have time for any questions. <laughs> and he made, he made that promise. And uh, so I borrowed a speech that Dr. Diefenbach had used for a similar occasion someplace, read that on the plane, went up there and talked, and sure enough, as soon as it was over, he jumped up and said, Dr. Green has to catch the next plane and get back to Washington. We got in and got out. <laughs> but that was a, that was a kind of quick uh, shock therapy that I had when I got to Washington was to learn more about the attitude of the private practitioners to the federal government and, and what we were trying to do. Because I, as I learned later, there was a real controversy going on up there. They were opposing something that the federal government was trying to do, and they wanted their congressman to come, and they were going to gripe at him. And, I, and he just threw me right in the middle of it. That was, that was a time in which the, um, the government was, was sort of rapidly expanding the health manpower um, pool. Uh, and, and you were in the, in the midst of that. As, as you reflect back now, I mean, also having been a dean, what would be your sort of Monday morning quarterback call on that? Well, what was, yeah, what was happening, both we were rapidly expanding the manpower pool, we were also expanding the use of uh, auxiliaries, hygienists, and assistants at the time to increase the capacity of the working force to be able to do more in a shorter period of time. Well, the, the problem was in, in federal or public policy, um, the pendulum never stops in the middle. You start over here and it's something it's, it's out of whack, so you give it a big push and it just keeps right on going, but it never stops where it should. And uh, we went too far, too fast, and it should have been turned off beforehand. Mm -hmm. I remember giving some talks about that in some of my moves around the country and said it would be better if we could slow down now and uh, begin to um, have the workforce be more productive rather than trying to continue producing more dentists. But it never caught on. In fact, I even went to, to a meeting in the secretary's office, a planning session about legislation, and I said, I think we've gone far enough in dentistry, may need more in medicine, but I think we ought to slow down. And one of the planning officials, one of the assistant secretaries said, well, uh, we still need more dentists. And I said, well, where's your data? He said, well, I said, I don't care what kind of data you have, but I can't get an appointment for three weeks in my area over in Reston, Virginia. And I said, well, you know, we could get one dentist and assign him over there and solve the nation's problem if that's what <laughs> we're trying to do. Uh, he never listened to me, and they went kept on going. I think we went, up, went too far, obviously, and, and created more than we should have, and we've had to then to ring out Mm -hmm. the number of practitioners the last several years. When, when you look at, at that period, what would, you, um, what would you say was your major accomplishment? I mean, if, if you look back at, at that period as, as chief dental officer and, and say, what would, what would you list as the, as the thing that you're probably most proud of? Uh, well, one of the things that we did that was, I thought was important was the, the um, special grants that we provided to schools that enabled them to do some curriculum research and develop faculty and uh, improve the quality of, of education during that period. And also the National Health Service Corps that started pr putting dentists in places for underserved populations. I thought those were probably the, the major mm -hmm. things in, in dentistry during that time. When I was up in the Surgeon General's office as the Deputy Surgeon General, however, there I thought the major contribution was more bringing dentistry and the consciousness of dental problems into the larger po health policy arena. The ability to do that was, uh, made it, uh, uh, I thought, very beneficial being up there. Um, the you then made the transition from public health service to dean, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of curious about how you how you saw that as part of the continuum. And okay, so I just go back just one sure. bit on, on this other sure. on the deputy surgeon general. There's a bit of another interesting piece in here that I've always thought of uh, when I was called by the surgeon general and asked whether or not I would be willing to come and be there, wanted to talk with me about it, and the interview by the surgeon general was. Very interesting, he went through a lot of my background, which he had already looked up, but went over it again. And he asked me a question. He said, uh, why, shouldn't I, why shouldn't I do that? 
what do you know about yourself or what are your weakness so on I said your biggest problem Surgeon General is the fact that I am not a physician I'm a dentist he said I know that and he said why do you say that I said, well it's always been it's always been a physician and your physician friends are really going to be upset if you have a dentist in here someone other than a physician he said you just convinced me that I should do it and he was a very wise man in that he felt that he shouldn't be limited by a degree but what a person might be able to do in that role which I was very proud of the fact that he had said uh, go and for it. The Surgeon General was was who? That was Julius, Dr. Julius Richmond. He was served as both Assistant Secretary for Health and, and Surgeon General and he asked me to be his deputy for the one hat on the Surgeon General part. What was, what was that experience like working for, for Richmond? That was uh, that was an entirely, it was another one of those sort of forced career development, which you, as I always call it, when you throw you into a situation mm -hmm. like that. Uh, it was great. He brought me into everything that he was doing, and uh, he was a very good teacher and was very patient with, uh, with my uh, limited background in a way. But the fact that I had started out, as I mentioned before, living in interns' quarters when I was in mm -hmm. dental school and working in the hospital and living in the medical fraternity house and having been a bureau director coming across a broad spectrum prepared me pretty well to have a broader view than, than many dentists would have had in moving in there. And I brought us some different perspectives for him, which I think was very useful and he appreciated. The fact that he um, also traveled a lot put me in a lot of situations that were I w would never have dreamed of, of being in. And I guess the one that I think back about the most, uh, two of them actually, one of them was the time when uh, I was, he was scheduled with a very busy schedule to go to f speak at the Friends of Harvard and then the, the press conferences and talks. And uh, uh, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter called and asked him to go with them to Cambodia and so he went and, and then they handed me the schedule and then I was to follow up and do all those. The one that kind of shook me the most was when I found myself at the Waldorf Astoria in front of a big bank of microphones. I mean, they were just a huge bank of them and all the reporters and big audience out there for a press conference on breast cancer. Uh, and I hadn't, uh, I knew I was going to have to go, and so what I had to do, and the, the, fact, the staff were very good about it, I would say, I've got to go do this, now get me prepared. And we'd spend sometimes overnight, people bringing me facts and this and that, and asking me questions and getting me prepared for it. They had to stuff my shirt in it <laughs> and get me up there. So, uh, that was uh, what I call forced career development. Those were awkward, but I, I enjoyed them yep. after the fact, getting ready for them. <laughs> Survival. <laughs> right. Uh, that's, that's what it was like, exciting, uh, long hours, uh, but never knowing what the next, next issue is going to be, whether it's at the secretary's level or up on the hill or out in some, some large group. Let me ask a different question. I, I'm, there's a lot of discussion now about the role of government in, in health care and including, you know, the, the vacancy still in the Surgeon General's office. And is, I'm wondering if, if you could reflect now on, on what your sense is about what role government should play or might play or what, you know, or, or at least some of your views on the current discussion. Well, one focused response is the Surgeon General himself or herself. There's a, in, in the legislation now that's up before Congress would do away with the role of the Surgeon General, would not fund that office anymore. I strongly believe that the country needs to have a voice that can be provided by a top professional such as the Surgeon General Dr. Richmond or Dr. Uh, Coop. I think the country needs to have, in these times when all the things that are occurring in health, you need to have somebody who is a, a professional, but who's not tied to any one administration who can tell the people, this is what, this is where we are, and these are things that we need to pay attention to, such as drug abuse, uh, the use of tobacco, and uh, we need to get care to the underserved, and all of that. To be, to be it's kind of a bully pulpit, really, on behalf of the people. And we don't have that today. 
because we don't have a Surgeon General. That's what it was intended to be in the beginning. In fact, it had that plus all of the commissioned officers under as a line, line authority. And I thought it served well, and I think it would serve well now. And if it doesn't have that in the future, I don't know who's going to take the place of that. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the government's role in the delivery of care, uh, I think we need a need to do try to encourage states to do what they can do, but the forgotten people, the people who are left out, someone somehow needs to make sure that they are getting have access to the care that they need. I'm afraid what is happening now with um, the comp competitive uh, uh, health maintenance organizations and all of that, which has some good features, everybody is trying to get at the people who have access, who can pay, pay the premiums Yep. And but then seem to be cutting away any money to go to help those who can't help themselves, and that's what I worry about. And that's where a role for the federal government, I believe, is is in that arena. It's focused attention should be there, and I, it, somehow that's going to have to get filled in. Could I just go back one other sure. piece that I was going to mention in the, yep. in the Surgeon General? The other role that I had was in the Cuban refugee crisis. Again, the Surgeon General was out of town. Uh, the, uh, there were a number of refugees, you remember, were released by Castro, came to this country, and there were criminals and mentally ill people, and uh, just let them loose, and they came in, and then we had to do something with them. A large number of them ended up at, uh, in Washington, D.C., at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which is run by the federal government. And there was a riot one night. <clears throat> then they called the Surgeon General, and he was out of town. And uh, I happened to be there, and they called and said, why don't they come over and see if I could quell the riot at uh, St. East. Well, it's pretty hard for, <laughs> for one person, regardless of what, to who you are, to quell a riot. The problem was there was a, a, a battle over who was in charge. These were people who had not been cleared by the uh, uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service. FEMA was not, the uh, Federal em uh, Emergency Management Association was not uh, uh, prepared to take responsibility for them. The District of Columbia was not in charge mm -hmm. of them because these were people in, on our grounds and the public health service grounds. And the question was, who's going to deal with this? And there was a, really a, an awful riot going on. They were wrecking the place, uh, almost like a bomb had gone off inside. They'd already done so mm -hmm. much damage. Finally had to do was get a federal SWAT team to go with me, to take me in, to get inside, to mm -hmm. get the group together. And what we decided to do was to get to corner the worst actors and uh, put them in isolation in the hospital and commit them to the, to the mental hospital and drug them and put them in there, get them out of the way. So, so safekeeping for themselves as well as everyone else until we could uh, get the jurisdiction squabble settled. And finally mm -hmm. had to bring in a group. They formed a ring around the whole place to keep anybody from coming in, anybody from getting out, because they were breaking the walls down and breaking windows and getting out. I had to bring in a team from Texas from the Immigration and Naturalization Service, because it really was their responsibility to work with FEMA hmm. to, get it, to get it settled. And then the ACLU said we were not treating them properly, so it, it got to be hmm. quite a mess before we got through. Okay. But that was, that was a role this dentist from Eastern Kentucky <laughs> ended up working. got thrown with. into. I'm you, sorry, now we're... Yeah, well, I, I, I wanted to, um, to get to your 10 years as dean. Oh, yeah. And, I, and okay. I was sort of curious. You, you made the transition from public health service to dean, and I, I wonder if you could sort of reflect on okay. and, and the, those, that decade. Um, as, as I was finishing up, um, there were, as we were, it looked like we were heading to a transition of government, and... Uh, uh, Dr. Richmond was beginning to think about where he was going to, what was going to happen mm -hmm. to him. Some of my friends from California contacted me and said that there was a deanship open in San Francisco and uh, wonder if I would come and take a look at it. And I said, no, I'm, I live in Washington, I have a nice home and family settled and all of that. He said, well, surely you're going to be on the West Coast. And I went out while I was there and they uh, got me interested in it and they ended up being there. A lot of people were asking the question, what is this, what do you call it, dry-fingered dentist, <laughs> public Bureaucr health? 
bureaucrat. Bureaucrat <laughs> from the federal government who's never had a full-time position in an academic setting. What is he, why, why is he capable of being a dean? So I, I got asked the same kind of question in a different way uh, from a lot of people who were there, especially alumni. And I said, uh, they asked me that directly, and I said, well, first of all, I'm licensed in California. I've taken your state board, and I took a license, and did the gold foils, and I did all that before. Um, I believe that management is a major issue in education today, and I've had a lot of management experience. I've um, been monitoring uh, health profession schools of all kinds, and I believe this is good background for it, and I believe there are key people here who know a lot about the workings of dental education. I bring a different perspective together, and hopefully we can do it. And I think it worked out that way. Uh, I had some major challenges given me by the, by the chancellor when I arrived. He said that uh, we have really top medical school, pharmacy school, and uh, nursing school here who are really ranked among the top in the, in the country and in the world. And I would like to see the dental school at that level. So it's primarily is focused on clinical dentistry, and uh, it's more of a trade school than the rest. That was his opinion. And uh, it's uh, isolated on one end of the campus. And I believe it should be a part of the whole and should be at the same level as the other schools. And I want you to do something about that. Hmm. And there's no more money. <laughs> so um, we uh, went after that. and. Uh, recruited some top people to come and help me to be department chairs, reorganized, and they tried to do away with sort of what I call the balkanization mm -hmm. of the school where there were so many people reporting to the dean. Uh, there were a lot of divisions. There were 17 divisions and departments that reported to the dean. I got it down to five instead of that. And uh, had I been more from inside, it would have been difficult to do, and I was naive enough to take all that on and pull it together. How did you like being a dean? Uh, I enjoyed it. It was one of, the, one of the most fascinating parts of my career, getting to be with students and being able to build the science base. We were, you know, we were ranked about 15th at the beginning, and now for the last three years, the school has uh, been the top research school in the country for, in terms of grants from NIH. Turned it around to make it a, a school that's on a par with the other schools uh, on campus and is involved in the whole campus, involved in the whole university system now, and it's one of which I am very proud. And what, what do you see yourself doing now that you're retired? Well, uh, that's what my wife keeps asking, <laughs> when are you retiring? Um, I have actually retired as more of a change of venue. Um, I have uh, gone uh, to be busy with my computer. We have two computers at home now, and I have a fax machine, and I'm on email, and doing a number of things with the university. Uh, the chancellor has appointed a task force to look at the impact of health care reform on the academic health center itself, the whole. And I'm a co-chair of that and trying to help the schools and the medical center deal with that and uh, then serving on a number of advisory committees around the country, one on, at NIH on women's health issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm continuing with a, on a whole another facet that we haven't had an opportunity to get into, and that's my work on the use of smokeless tobacco among professional baseball players, which I started a number of years ago and have been funded by NIH on that one and continuing to work on that. And uh, now working with Joe Garagiola on a national uh, what he calls spit tobacco education program. And we have applied for another large grant. And uh, that will occupy a lot of my time, which circles back to my beginning with my dad, uh, who, who was a, a, great, a great interest in baseball. And so it brings me a lot of pleasure right. being involved in that, going to the games and getting to know the players and doing something good for the country, which I think is important, the use of tobacco. Let me let me switch from all of this professional stuff and, and yeah. have you talk about your family for a second. Um, you, you mentioned okay. your wife. Yeah, um, my wife and I uh, married in 1957, and so that's I have to stop and think here. That's 38, mm -hmm. 38 yep. years. Yep. We've been married. Uh, we have a wonderful family. We're very 
very proud of. They all live in, in and around the Bay Area. We have three children, a son, and then twin daughters. And then we, they've uh, produced six grandchildren. All of them live in the Bay Area. Our son is a pediatrician, graduated, went through the uh, University of California, San Francisco. By the way, he had decided, had, had applied and decided to go there to school before I went out to be dean. Mm -hmm. So, and our daughters went to school on the West Coast. So we tell everybody we went away to college with our kids and, and got to be with them during that time. Our daughters uh, were employed, but now are full-time moms and having mm -hmm. a great time raising their kids. We're all within an hour of each other within, within the Bay Area. And I'm just so proud of them that they're all doing well and uh, we're very happy out there. When, when, you, when you look back uh, and, and you look at the various twists and turns your career took, um, are there any of those that you would have, you think as you look back that you would have taken a different turn? Or that you should have taken a different turn? Well, uh, I, I really can't. There's one piece that I wish I had done, but if I had, I probably wouldn't have gotten back on track had I done it. I wish I'd had a couple of years or more to work with Dr. Hall and that, that practice in Nashville. Right, right. But if I had done that, I would never, probably never would have gotten mm. away from there. And I, that, I would have missed so much. It's uh, been a wonderful career. I, yeah. For me, I had so many wonderful opportunities to be at the right place at the right time. And, uh, many opportunities for what, I, for what I call forced career development. Yeah. Probably out of it all, uh, I'm going to answer a question you haven't asked. Uh, contribution, simple, very simple one, major, a major contribution, I feel, is the oral hygiene index, <laughs> which was a kind of a happenstance kind of thing to do. Example of that. And, and all the things that followed, all the studies we've done on the relationship of uh, oral hygiene and plaque to periodontal disease. Example of that, not long ago I was in, um, in Japan and the dean of the school was taking me around to introduce and the students were in a large study room and he says, this is uh, Dr. John Green and uh, the uh, author, he and uh, Ian Vermillion authors of the Oral Hygiene Index, and the students all stood up and bowed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, he told me why. He said, they have to know that for their final exam, and they also have to have, to have that for, to get a license. They have to know what it is and have to mm -hmm. pass the exam that includes the Oral Hygiene Index, so they know very well who mm -hmm. you are. Um, I've got a question that I'd like to ask you about something that um, um, you was presented, uh, your presentation, to the International Association of Dental Research as president-elect. And it was something that I, I think it will be interesting to the, um, the viewer at large and, and certainly of interest to the International College of Dentists. Um, the, the challenge that you were making in, in that presentation was to develop a worldwide collaborative effort to improve the quality of the human condition through improved oral health. Uh, and then you go on to say, um, that you would see that, that a forum would uh, contemplate where dentistry and oral health will be heading worldwide by the middle of the next century, uh, and then calling through your talk for a coordinated worldwide effort, um, uh, feeling that that would be essential for these complex issues to be addressed effectively. I wonder if you could talk for just a minute or so about that and, and tell us where that is and, and, and what's happening with this. Yeah, I was concerned about the, the sort of fragmented efforts that are being made by various international organizations, fragmented in the sense that each following its own agenda and trying to do its, its thing. <coughs> its thing. And, but since there are limited resources for dentistry and there's so much to be done internationally, I felt if we somehow those efforts could be coordinated better, what to collectively we might be able to do more than each of us alone. And um, following that address, the uh, IEDR decided that um, we should move ahead with that and ask, and, and we've, as a result of that, formed an International Dental Leadership Forum and asked me to chair that or to sponsor it for a while. And uh, we did and had several meetings uh, with the trying to cover the various aspects of dentistry, the research and the education the practice in which was primarily FDI, and then government, which was WHO. 
and included in that industry as well, some representative industry since they're involved internationally mm -hmm. with their advertising mm -hmm. and sponsoring of meetings and so on. And I think there have been four or five meetings of that group now. Uh, and uh, that has been very helpful, at least for information sharing about when and where meetings are going to be held and what the major themes mm -hmm. are and, and how we each might be able to relate to each other. Some, diff some practical difficulties, however, so everyone is so busy with so many mm -hmm. meetings now, adding another meeting has become mm -hmm. a bit of a problem. So what we've tried to do is, is hook it on to the, either the IEDR meeting or the FDI meeting, but then whoever the host is, uh, they're so busy they have a hard time attending mm -hmm. and paying attention mm -hmm. to this. The meetings have been running about a half day, and the last one that was held was in Singapore uh, at the IEDR meeting. That's the only one that I've not been mm -hmm. able to attend. At that one, they've decided for a period to have just the executive officers of those organizations mm -hmm. meet uh, once or twice a year to coordinate schedules. There, everybody recognizes there's some need to do go beyond that and to have, say, take a particular project or an area of the world that we want to focus on and use each of our organizations to try to move something forward, S say China and say we want to get some people there to help build the research or to get, uh, and, and also mm -hmm. their educational program and have industry bring in support some of the activities within. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things we anticipate mm -hmm. for the future, but it takes a lot of doing to yep. make it happen. Yep. I really yep. think it's needed, and everyone r agrees with that. It, it's the doing that is the question, how do we, how do we get it done? So I think the idea is right. It's, whether there are practical reasons that may keep it from it, but I hope it will keep going. Great. Um, one, one other question I want to ask you about um, during that tenure as, as dean at, the, um, at UC San Francisco, um, you were active, I put it in the past tense, you are active with the Institute of Medicine, and I'm, I'm wondering about um, some of the things that were happening in, in your Institute of Medicine role. Yeah, I was fortunate to be elected to the Institute of Medicine uh, some time ago, and, and um, while I was serving on the governing council of uh, IOM, the executive committee of the AADS uh, said, you know, after we've gone through closure of a number of schools and scaling down the, the, the uh, size of schools, and we also had a lot of strategic planning going on, uh, it would be helpful to have uh, an objective group take a look at where dental, e dental education is going and how it best fit in the, in the university. And since I was on a governing council, they asked if I would take that request from the executive committee to the council of IOM and ask them if they would be willing to conduct such a study. And fortunately, I was able to do that, and uh, they said yes, they would like to look at it. And then they had a planning committee or planning session held, and I chaired that and had representatives from all aspects of dentistry get mm -hmm. together and they yes, said, yes, we'd like to move ahead. And now a study has been completed. After it took about almost two years to, to conduct and cost a little over a million dollars to conduct. And I think it's a real landmark report that has come out as a result of that activity. And uh, I think will help uh, dentistry and dental education in the years ahead. It, hopefully it will, I believe it will be a landmark, uh, sort of like the Guy's report, a Flexner report, as we look back on it in the future. When, um, when you look at your career, and um, if, if your dad was around and um, took a look at what you'd done, what would you think he would say? Uh, he'd be very proud. Let me tell you what my mother used to say. She used to say, John, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and I would say, why, why are you sorry, Mom? She'd say, well, I'm sorry I encourage you to go into dentistry. She never understood. She said, you, uh, you work so hard and travel so much. She said, uh, I'm sorry that I called you to do that. She said, you would have gotten to be home more. And hmm. And I kept him, <laughs> said, don't, don't tell me that, because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. But she was very sad. They were both very proud. They were so proud of, of what I did. And I would send them things, and it would end up in the newspaper. <laughs> uh, Dad would have enjoyed my work with uh, professional baseball. 
uh, and, and, and your service to humanity. Hmm? And your service to humanity. Uh, well, yes, yes, he, he would have appreciated that. But he also, I don't think either of them ever understood the full scope of what I was doing because I never really had an opportunity to tell them. I never did tell them. I didn't want to be bragging all the time, but I knew they were proud of yeah. whatever it was I was doing. Are you telling them now? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.